We live in, we live in a floodplain uh, that most of you will be very, very familiar with. We're bounded by the Waimakariri River to the north. We have the Otukai Kino, which flows into the Waimakariri, and the Styx flowing down through to Brooklands and Spencerville. We've got the Avon River, the Heathcote Catchment, and the Hallswall, and the a coastal marine area as well. The types of flooding we can see in Christchurch, this is a map that you saw earlier with Peter Kingsbury, it's the, um, the, Waim uh, the, uh, the potential for the Waimakariri River breaking out. I suppose in terms of total damage, the Waimakariri River represents our greatest risk from, from flooding, uh, based on the, the, the velocity and the, and the, the total depth of, uh, depth of the water that would uh, occur in a breakout of that nature. But we have uh, within Christchurch a number of floodplains, a number of ponding basins. This is the Cranford Basin. Okay. Let's just talk about the Wymac um, flooding just for a moment. Um, the, uh, the flooding that we would expect in the Wymac at the moment uh, we regard as pretty minimal. Uh, and the reason for that is we do have uh, some stop banks. Let me poke this thing around the other way. Uh, running along either side of the WIMAC. Uh, and those stop banks um, are not only a single stop bank now, but they're a double stop bank. Uh, and, that, and that theoretically, uh, according to a sort of a, a flood risk type approach, uh, the risk of overtopping both of those stop banks is something like one in 10,000 years, which isn't unlike what was being talked about in terms of the uh, risk from the Port Hills uh, that they're trying to protect against. <clears throat> uh, the, the other type uh, of failure mode that you might get from that uh, is erosion. Uh, and also you'll see a slide a little bit later in terms of uh, what can happen in terms of an erosive um, breakout uh, from, from that river. We're still suffering from that risk. It's unclear exactly what that uh, risk level is, uh, but uh, we regard it as being tolerable uh, and for as far as our floor level setting and all that sort of thing goes around the city, we um, do not account for these sort of breakouts because we think something like a 1 in 10,000 year risk profile uh, is reasonable to live with. So. Uh, as Mike said, uh, we have other sorts of uh, flooding around the town uh, and this is a shot uh, taken back, you know, I think about 1940 or something, might have been later than that, um, of Cranford Basin. Now Cranford Basin is something that we are familiar with as uh, water engineer type people, <coughs> but uh, you may not understand it quite that way. It's a dip in the land, if you're travelling north up Cranford Street, uh, you'll go into some agricultural land and then back uh, into, into uh, built up areas again. And that's the area we call Cranford Basin. It's a natural ponding basin and that's the sort of thing that happens when you have uh, uh, storm events. <clears throat> now, other sorts of things, uh, of course, uh, Peter was talking about before, was uh, we can, we, we're on the coast and we're subject to uh, coastal effects, uh, so we have mean sea level, we have normal high tides, uh, we have storm surges, uh, and we have wave run up and so on, and we're living with that sort of a risk as well. <clears throat> now if you want to know about uh, drainage in the city, there is a very good history uh, and uh, called Swamp the City and it describes you know, what has happened. Uh, Christchurch uh, became renowned uh, for uh, diseases, uh, waterborne diseases, and uh, the um, Christchurch Drainage Board was set up basically to sort all that out, and they focused mostly initially uh, on uh, sewage and so on and so on, and latterly uh, on, on drainage, but it's very good history. So let's just wander back. Uh, first of all, this is, interestingly enough, the breakout of the Waimakariri River uh, in 1868. That's a photograph of the Waimak flowing down 
the Avon Channel uh, out in front of the provincial chambers. Um, so it, it has and it can happen. Uh, other flooding, Barrington Street opposite Sprayden Park, uh, 1925. Uh, another breakout of the WIMAC, uh, 1926. Whoops. Uh, corner of Colombo Street and Tennyson Street, uh, 1945. So I think it's probably a little bit worse than we just experienced, but not unlike some of the things we just had. Uh, and here's your Waimakariri stop bank breakout in 1950. Now, what, what you're seeing there, oops, is a section of the stop bank actually washed away. And it's that sort of failure that I was talking about before uh, that can still happen, and we don't know exactly what the risk of that is. But with a second stop bank in behind that, the risk is, we think, a lot less. Uh, Sumner, 1968. Uh, there's been some considerable work done there with a main relief drain since then. Uh, and in this latest event, Sumner fared pretty jolly well, really, all things considered. Uh, and of course, we've got Flockton Street uh, in the Flockton area, and they suffered quite badly. Uh, closer to here, Heathcote River, uh, just last week. So we're still living with it. Now, what's the city and what's the drainage board actually done over the years uh, to deal with flooding type uh, effects? Um, we talked first of all about the stop banks and um, uh, that was one major strategic thing. This was... Uh, Another major strategic thing which was uh, put in place uh, following a lot of uh, flood events back in the 1970s, uh, and we call it the Dudley Creek Diversion. And it takes water from the uh, upper Dudley Creek, uh, diverts it through Cranford Basin I was talking to you about before, uh, through a pumping station about here, down through a 2.1 metre diameter pipeline, all the way down to Horseshoe Lake over in this area here. And since uh, the late 80s when it was put in place, it has provided uh, quite a reasonable amount of protection to the, the Flockton area. Uh, but it appears that the earthquakes have changed uh, their flood risk uh, and we're now getting much more frequent flooding there than we would have expected. Just to give you a bit of an idea, this is one of the pumps at that pump station. This is an Archimedes screw pump, uh, and there are two about that size and another smaller one, and they're just in that one pump station. Um, closer to here, we've got uh, some works in the Heathcote River, uh, and they were in response to this sort of flooding. Uh, so this is before the Heathcote, uh, the Diversion, 1941, uh, Sullivan Avenue, Judge Street, uh, down in Wollstone. And what it, that is, is what we call the Wollstone Cut. Now just, so we've got the uh, Heathcote River wandering its way down into the estuary, and the cut runs across this yellow band. And here it goes. So uh, quite a pleasant little, uh, little area. Uh, what was found though was after it was put in place, it was put in place without any barrier in it. Uh, and the, uh, what we found, or my predecessors found anyway, was that uh, salt water uh, came back up the river. Uh, the trees further up the river started dying. The banks on the, on the river uh, started uh, weakening uh, and it was found to be necessary to put, oops, Daisy, to put in a barrage, which is this guy here. So that's only open now uh, when there is a flood event on uh, and that lets the water go.
go through the, the cut and much more directly out to the estuary uh, and thus reduce the flooding in the uh, Wollstone area. Uh, the other big features around town uh, are the stop banks along the Avon. Uh, and you'll see these particular ones here, or in fact all the ones right up the, up the length of the stop bank uh, area, have been uh, raised after the earthquake. Uh, this is the area, of course, of most of the settlement. Uh, so these stop banks were raised well, in various places, a metre or so. And you can see there uh, where the uh, old stop banks were along here, and the bit that has actually uh, been put in place to actually increase their height. Uh, they've been tested several times uh, since then. So it was uh, definitely the right decision to put these in in a temporary way. Uh, they are in a location which we still see as quite vulnerable. Uh, so one of the big decisions that we're going to have to make uh, is, you know, should we keep them there and reinforce them, or should we shift them back to a, a more stable sort of a location? Uh, and <clears throat> I'll show you some pictures about that a little bit later. Now, some other features a bit further away from here. Uh, and these are tide gates uh, on the Styx River. Uh, now these fit into the stop bank along the Waimakariri River and protect the floodplain <coughs> in behind uh, the, the stop banks. Can you see them here? They're just like uh, doors uh, which open up uh, when the tide on the side here goes down and they close back up, up when, the, when the tide on the side gets up and protects the floodplain in behind there. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. Right, other sort of things that have happened. Um, uh, when the city started off, uh, we had city limits that looked like this. Uh, now we're talking about city limits which are this big, uh, and that changes the hydrology of the place. Uh, if you start making the area impermeable, which we're doing by doing that sort of thing, you might well double the amount of runoff. And we're still putting it down the same channels, uh, so we could do, do something about that, <coughs> all put up with the consequences. Uh, sea level rise, that was uh, discussed briefly before by Peter. Um, now, there's nothing unusual about sea level rise. It has been happening at a fairly steady rate uh, at least for the last 100 years, as shown on that sort of a graph. <clears throat> the issue that people, talk, that people are worried about, about sea level rise, is about accelerating sea level rise, or the acceleration of sea level rise. Uh, and um, the fact that that might be uh, perhaps a half a metre or a metre by the end <coughs> of the century or shortly after. Uh, and we, there is a report from Tonkin and Taylor which talks about that and suggests that by, say, uh, 2115, we might be dealing with a sea level uh, which is uh, a metre higher than what we're dealing with at the moment. Uh, and we have to think about that now in terms of how we plan for that sort of future. <clears throat> and we are doing flood maps and so on which display what that might mean. Uh, and here's one such scenario, uh, a 50 metre, uh, sorry, a 50 year return interval uh, storm event uh, and a one metre sea level rise. And so, uh, so we've got an estuary. I have shown here some uh, red zone areas uh, and the deeper blue is the deeper colour, uh, is the deeper water. The lighter blue is the lighter water. So the um, uh, main suspects areas are still there, uh, and um, but they're just a bit wider now in this sort of a scenario than what they were, were before. Uh, but at least we do know, know about it. And we're in a position now of rebuilding the city, so why build it, why rebuild it without taking these sort of things into account? And we can do all sorts of numbers here and work out 
uh, how many people uh, might be affected by that or how many properties might be effect affected by these changes and those sort of statistics we can uh, put together and make up some numbers to look at cost benefits and so on and so on. <clears throat> now, other effects. Um, earthquake. Uh, what we're seeing here, again, if I get you orientated, the estuary along the coastline, uh, up the main channel of the uh, Avon River. Um, the red indicates the areas that have settled uh, and the, mostly uh, we're talking about uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 uh, in these uh, river basin areas. The green on this side here indicates the areas that have actually risen and so this, this area over here has risen by uh, about a half a metre in round figures and of course